Hey there, welcome back to the Path to Zion podcast where we are rediscovering the ancient way. We are moving towards a conclusion of this series, what it means to keep Yahweh's Torah. Um, a proper look at the word keep in Hebrew, shamer. And we've covered a lot of ground. Um, for the sake of time, we're not going to go and talk about all of it all over again. Um, I believe we've, we've hit some good high points here uh, of thought that may not be common knowledge for everyone. Um, I don't believe this is anything that's necessarily some big secret. It's just for whatever reason, we've not heard about it before. We have inherited, as let's go all the way to the back, um, uh, to the beginning. At the very beginning of this, when we first did an introduction, we were talking about even in the English dictionary, to keep is to hold or retain in one's possession, to continue on in action or course and to preserve. And the antonym, the opposite, of course, would be to, uh, to release. And so for whatever reason, I think it's worth discussing. We have to ask a question, why have we released, <laughs> relinquished Yahweh's Torah? Why have we failed to keep it, guard it? Why have we failed to keep, guard, protect, preserve, and treasure Yahweh's Sabbath? Like, why has this happened? I believe we really hit the nail on the head in the last ser- the last part of the series when we talked about the, the deeper Hebrew words found in Genesis. And, and that understanding, you'll have to go back if you've not watched that. I'd say that was probably going to be the meat and potatoes of this series. I believe it's a pattern that, that we are not exempt from, and we have just inherited and we're carrying on in our own way. In the most modern version of what we've seen throughout the timeline of humanity. Um, one thing I want to talk about for a little bit here, um, as we do move to a conclusion... I want to make sure I'm in order here because a lot of these things are, I've got some notes I'm trying to con, just make uh, more concise to bring this to an end. One thing building off of what we talked about moments ago, depending on when you watched it, of course, um, I want to talk about for a little further. And I ask a question, was keeping, was what we've established is keeping the Torah, was keeping a command a necessary result of sin? Okay, because, and if I can, if I could put this into words, if Father will help me, the reason I say this is because whether the language is specific or insinuated, Torah has been taught to us and we have carried along as a belief that somehow Yahweh's Torah, His laws, His way to live was because we're just sinful, wretched people that need told what to do until Jesus came. And now we're free in him to listen to the Spirit. And so piggybacking off of what I shared in the last part, I just want to um, highlight some things that will move us to a conclusion here. Please listen as I read this paragraph that I've written, um, you know, weeks ago. The consequence of sin was not for man to be made to serve and keep Yahweh's law in the Garden of Eden. Okay? Keeping, properly defined, as hopefully I've, I've done in any measure at all in this series, keeping, as far as Shamer goes, preceded the fall and rebellion of Adam and Eve. Okay? Keeping, according to the proper, proper biblical use that I've hopefully established, was not ever detrimental or burdensome even from its first appearance, okay? This may sound like I'm being redundant, but I really want to highlight this paragraph and make clear as we wrap this up that we have to understand the beginnings of everything. And so Yahweh's Torah, His way to live, His commands, because there's little t and there's capital T, His way to live was not as a result of man's disobedience, but in fact, it was given preceding that for man to know how to live, how to be found, preserved, and kept and guarded themselves. Back at the very beginning of this series, we we read the first mention of Shamir. It was in Genesis 2.15. Then Yahweh Elohim took the man and put him, gave him rest in... um, Yanach, we talked about that in the last part. 
in, in the Garden of Eden to cultivate and shamer it, okay? To continue this train of thought, if we rightly use this text, I would submit that when we're keeping Yahweh's order as He designed, we too are at rest. We highlighted that a little bit before. Even in our labors, why? Well, to use the Bible some more, because His burden is what? It's easy and it's light, okay? Yet there's still a burden, people. There is still a yoke. So if modern doctrines come to us, however they come, and they tell us that there's nothing for us to do anymore, there's nothing to do anymore except receive the gift of grace. What is this burden then? What is this burden in Yeshua that is easy and a yoke that is light? What is this yoke? Well, there is still a learning of obedience through the suffering of submission to Yahweh's ways that will produce obedience in us in the same way it did in Messiah. As we recently endeavored to study in the Abraham and Isaac series that I posted uh, maybe five, six weeks ago now, faith must be demonstrated, tested, to know that it's an, that is an intact um, uh, substance. We're told faith is a substance. Thereby, obedience is the evidence, <laughs> the fruit that one has been redeemed and marked as Yahweh's possession, his people. Why? We know the biblical pattern, Yahweh's set apart capital P people, keep his ways. They shamer his ways. We love them. We preserve them. We uphold them. Let's read some more scriptures. And why would we read these? <laughs> because the Word is alive, and the more we hear what the Word says towards these specific matters, the more it can sweep out the dust of bad doctrine that we've inherited. Now, sometimes it's not just dust on us. Sometimes it's latched on to our little, literal organs, and it needs like extracted painfully, depending on where you are. But it does need repaired. Hearing it, reading it, the word that is, it'll help us eradicate the bad doctrine that we've inherited. And we, we, it will at least have a chance, an opportunity to, to replace those areas in our life with truth. Again, we're attempting to redefine Father's intention towards Him using the word shamer to keep. Okay? Psalm 119, 33 through 35. Teach me the way of your statutes, Yahweh. I shall comply with it to the end. Give me understanding so that I may comply with your Torah and keep it with all my heart. Again, here we are. I will shamer, guard, preserve, treasure it from my heart. This is a heart issue. It always has been. Make me walk in the path of your commandments, for I delight in it. <laughs> Does this sound burdensome? Does David ever write one of his dozens of psalms about loving Yahweh's Torah? Does it ever sound burdensome? Does it ever sound like a burden no man can bear? Never. He took delight in Yahweh's Torah. Leviticus 18.5 You shall therefore keep my statutes and my rules. If a person does them, he shall live by them. I am Yahweh. Exodus 31, 16 and 17. Therefore the people of Israel shall keep the Sabbath and observe the Sabbath throughout their generations as a covenant forever. It is a sign forever <laughs> between me and the people of Israel that in six days Yahweh made heaven and earth and on the seventh day rested and was refreshed, a guarding, a remembering, so let's keep reading some more. Um, I'm going to do this on purpose as we. this is going to be the end here. Biblical mentions of Shamer in order. Now, why would I do that? This would be good for us to just read from the very beginning to give us the context from there on into our age and beyond a proper understanding of how we keep Yahweh's commands. Genesis chapter 4, verse 9. 
And we already read ones that preceded that, which is why we're skipping those, so we're not redundant too much. Yahweh said to Cain, Where is Abel, your brother? I don't know, he said. Am I my brother's keeper? In other words, am I in charge of guarding him? Am I in charge of preserving him? Man began to shirk responsibility. Next up is Abraham, our model of faith and works, Genesis 19, 9 through 11. Yahweh said to Abraham, As for you, my covenant you must keep, you and your seed after you throughout their generations. Pause. Do you consider yourself Abraham's seed? I'm literally waiting on purpose. Do you, friend, wherever you sit in a chair of belief today towards new covenant doctrine, do you believe you are Abraham's promised seed and offspring? I really want you to decide and, and figure that out. <laughs> Yahweh said to Abraham, As for you, my covenant, you must keep you and your seed after you throughout their generations. This is my covenant that you must keep between me and you and your seed after you. All your males must be circumcised. Oh, man. Honey, am I an Abraham's seed as a Christian? Well, of course you are, honey. We're, we're the promise. We're in the lineage of the promise. We're the people of God. All right, well, we need to read Genesis 19 then. Covenant, Shamer, all generations, all seed after Abraham in his, in his family lineage. You must be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskin, and this will become a sign of the covenant between me and you. And again, for your seed after you, Abraham. Are we Abraham's seed? Do we shamer, keep guard Yahweh's ways? Or do we say, ha, I'm free in Jesus now. Circumcision doesn't matter to me. Don't talk about it to me. Doesn't matter. I'm in Jesus. I know what Paul said. Well, the question is, no, you don't. We just know the Pauline version we've been told. Skipping ahead a bit, Genesis 26, 4 and 5, I, Yahweh, I will multiply your seed like the stars of the sky, and I'll give your seed all these lands. And in your seed, all the nations of the earth will be continually blessed. Now, why will the nations of the earth be continually blessed as the seed of Abraham? Because Abraham listened to my voice, and he kept... My charge, he shamered my commands, my decrees, my instructions, the verse concludes in verse 5 of Genesis 26. If we follow the Torah scriptures into the life of Jacob, we will see my point come into view here as well. As we're reading biblical examples of just what I've been doing some commentary upon so that we have a foundation that's not my opinion. Yahweh is speaking, he says the following in Genesis chapter 28, 13 through 15. Yahweh was standing on top of it, which is the stairway that was set up on the earth. And he said this, I am Yahweh, the Elohim of your father Abraham and the Elohim of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give it to you and your seed. Here we are seed again. Here we are Abraham. Here we are promised offspring. Your seed will be as the dust of the land and you will burst forth to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south and in you all the families of the earth will be blessed and your seed behold verse 15 i am with you and i will watch over keep guard shamer you wherever you go and i will bring you back into this land for i will not forsake you until i've done what i yahweh have promised you covenant language. You keep, I will keep. You preserve, I will preserve. You guard, I will guard. It is Yahweh's ways. In absolute conclusion, we'll close the door on this one. We see the Greek equivalent of this shamer keeping when Yeshua is speaking to who's been dubbed the rich young ruler. We're all familiar with this story. Matthew chapter 19, 16, and 17. And he came to Yeshua and he said this, Teacher, what good thing shall I do so that I may obtain eternal life? 
And he, Yeshua, said to this man, Why are you asking me about what is good? There is only one who is good, capital O. But if you want to enter life, keep the commandments. This is our Savior, our Messiah, doing what he labored to do his entire life, which purchased him the ability and the right to become who he is now, saying, listen, y'all, if you want to have eternal life, if you want the covenantal promises of my Father, keep the commandments. What more do we need to hear? What is it that's still lacking in our understanding? The biblical pattern is sure. Time and time again, we have examples of how one who is found within Yahweh's protection, guarded and kept by his hand, are the ones who willfully choose to guard, protect, and keep Yahweh's commands, to walk in his Torah. My hope is that we will all continue to venture out into becoming a set-apart people. People who love Father's ways. People who cry out like David cried out, said, Yahweh, I love your perfect Torah. Your Torah is perfect, reviving our souls. So we have spent an ample amount of time looking into the, the mysterious word that's been very misunderstood, Shamer. Friend, what do you think about now on the other side of what I've presented and into the days and, and weeks and years to come as you formulate thoughts towards what you do now? What are you doing now? <laughs> Friend, would you please consider that there seems to be a very clear biblical pattern that is in place that tells us what it means to properly understand how we keep Yahweh's Torah commands. They are to be guarded. They are to be treasured. They are to be valued and preserved for all of Yahweh's people from generation to generation in the lineage and in the seed of the man Abraham that, that Yahweh set apart to start his capital P people out of. So, friend, would you consider what I've presented? It's been a lot, I know. I've done the best that I know how today. Hopefully it's been made clear. If nothing else... Take 30 days and study Shamer. Study how to properly walk in the light, in the life of Torah, in the finished work of Yeshua empowered by Holy Spirit. It will change your life, friend. It will change your life entirely. And thereby, you'll be guarded. You'll be kept. You'll be watched over and treasured by Yahweh himself. That is a pretty good blessing, if you ask me. This has been the Path to Zion podcast. We're rediscovering the ancient way here. Thank you for tuning in. We'll have a, a lot more stuff coming at some point. Um, be blessed.